I heard the bells on Christmas Day Their old familiar carols play And wild and sweet the words repeat Of peace on earth, good will to men And thought how as the day had come The belfries of all Christendom Had rolled along the unbroken song Of peace on earth Good will to men. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, good will to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, good will to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime Of peace on earth, good will to men. Luke's Gospel this morning, Luke chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7 this morning in our part of our second part of our series, the arrival of the incarnate, the incarnation of Christ, the arrival of last Sunday morning. We looked at, began looking at what it means uh, to be God with us and the incarnation. And so we have the arrival of this morning. And last week we looked at the announcement of the incarnation and this great announcement that was made to Joseph and to Mary and to the shepherds. And so now we have the arrival uh, Jesus has arrived. The incarnate has arrived, the Son of God. And we're going to look at that this morning as we take a look at it. I want to welcome all of you that are watching by way of television with us this morning. Radio, internet, iPads, iPhones, YouTube, uh, Rumble Live and Facebook Live. And God bless you. Thanks for letting us come into your home this morning. We praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, good to be with you all this morning. And uh, before we get started, one other thing came to my mind as we're praying for people. Uh, let's not forget uh, uh, Joanne Bennett. If you remember John and Joanne that were here with us, and they're in North Carolina. She had an accident while, uh, not a while back, and I got letter and text yesterday that she is completely paralyzed. So you need to be praying for the Bennett family, all right? That's John and Joanne Bennett, and uh, she's going to be... Uh, in a bed uh, now for the rest of her life. John will be her full-time caregiver, and so you need to be praying for them, if you would, please. Okay, that's uh, Joanne Bennett, and she's now fully paralyzed from an accident that they had, and so just be lifting that family up, if you would, please. And you know, they would appreciate a call. They would appreciate a, uh, a phone number, a card. Uh, I believe we have that. Did we bring that with us? If not, we will have that for you. I'll bring it tonight. I'll bring it Wednesday night with us as well, where you can send them a card uh, to their place there in North Carolina and so uh, and be a blessing to them that you're praying for them, uh, wishing them the, the best of Christmas, a blessed Christmas, and a blessed New Year, and assuring them that God is still in control. God is still on the throne. He's still sovereign. <laughs> he runs the universe. He's still with us, and in these times, this is when the best advice or counsel I could get, you just got to trust Him. You've got to trust the Lord. Lean not unto your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. When we go through all these times, we've been telling our folks in the hospital even now, you've got to trust the Lord. I know you don't understand it, and, and you're wondering why and so forth, and we all would, all of us would. 
And I've come to the con conclusion that I simply have got to trust God. God knows what he's doing. He knows what's best. He has a plan for our life and so forth. And he's got everything in control. And he knows what's going on. And so uh, he'll do his thing uh, because it's his plan. We don't understand it all. And that's why because we don't, we have to trust him. We have to trust him. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we've got to trust him. For thou shalt not fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. And thy rod and thy staff shall comfort me. Thou anointest my head with oil. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. And God knows when that time will come. Because he's still in charge. Okay? The White House and those governments, you see, uh, they, they think they're uh, ruling in th right now. But God is still in charge. See, they're in a position of ruling and authority, yes. And because God has ordained the powers that be, even though you don't agree with it. But God is still in charge, not Washington, okay? Not the administration. God is still in charge. Nobody has kicked him off his throne, okay? He was on the throne in glory before he came here as a baby, and he went back to glory where he is now. And he's coming again from glory and taking the church home to be with him. So praise the Lord. I'm telling you. Let's read if we can. Beginning in verse number one of chapter two of the gospel of Luke. We begin reading. Yes, I can. Uh, let's see. I think I got something here. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I got one of these things. What do they call these things? Nat, nat tissue. Don't tell me Marines don't cry. Amen. All right. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus, the most powerful man in the world at that time, that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. All went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, the house of bread, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, wrapped him in grave clothes, because you see, he was born to die. And laid him in a manger, a cattle feeding trough, by the way, because there was no room for them in the inn. I hope you have room for Jesus today. Most of the world today says there's no room in their life for Christ. And I trust they would make room today as we look at the Word of God. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. And Lord, we have a lot of folks sick. We've got a lot of folks in the hospital right now, surgeries, waiting surgeries, an amputee. Lord, please, God, be with them. Father, bless them. Speak to their hearts. Let them know you love them and care for them, and that you're present with them and you're ever present. Comfort them, Holy Spirit of God. And help us to comfort them and be a blessing to them as well in the days ahead. Be with all of them that we've mentioned, Lord, please. May your will be done and accomplished in every person's life. And we trust that in the end results that Jesus will get all the glory, all the praise, for he deserves it all. Father, help them not to feel abandoned or like you've left. You've got this. You've got everything in control. Help us to be a blessing to them in these days. Father, now help your servant in this hour. We ask for your anointing and your power to come upon him. For we ask it in faith. We believe it in faith. We receive it in faith. Pray that souls will be saved. Lives will be changed. Folks will be blessed and drawn closer to Christ. As we look at the arrival of the incarnation. God with us. And we'll thank you for it. 
Jesus' name, amen and amen. You're going to have to bear with me a little bit this morning. I don't mean for this to be an emotional day, but it wasn't in my game plan. It's not here in my notes. Last week we opened with the verse, this verse in Matthew one twenty three: Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is the interpreted is God with us. So this morning we're going to turn past the announcement that we looked at last week of his of his arrival, and we see the uh, we're going to see the natural. Um, I got too much water in my eyes. The the actual arrival of Jesus, and that is Christ in Luke's gospel, chapter 2. And when we talk about the gospel, folks, Jesus is the gospel. He is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We talk about Luke's gospel, and we talk about he was laid in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. They were the common everyday grave clothes that they wrapped a body in for death because he was born to die because if he hadn't been born to die, we would have no gospel. See, without Christ, there is no gospel. And so we praise the Lord for the gospel. So I want us to, first of all, take a look at this in verse 1, the providential presence of God, the providential presence of God. And we're going to look at three aspects of this incarnation this morning, and that is the presence of Christ was providentially set forth by God himself. The providential arrival of of Christ was set by God himself. We see that in verse number one as we read it. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. So I want you to know that God originated history. God, he originates history. The word providence means pro video. It means to see It means to see before or ordained. And so God is moving uh, them from one place to another to fulfill the Scripture. God originated history. God's the originator of history. You understand that this morning. And we see this taking place in the providential presence of God. As his, and let's take a look at his plan is foretold. It was foretold. See, we're talking about history. We're going to go back and we're going to look at history to see that God originates history. Okay? And so we're going to go back and look where God foretold 700 years prior to this arrival of God incarnate in the flesh and his arrival. And we see that his plan was foretold where? In the Old Testament. That's why we got to have the Old Testament. That's why we need the Old Testament. That's why we depend on the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament gives us, tells us all about it, and the New Testament fulfills it. So we see this beautiful foretelling of this Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 14. We see the way he came. You see, God originates history. God is giving us this fact of history. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That was 700 years before this event took place, you see, which was history past. But see, because God is the originator of history. And he originated this whole plan, and he foretold it. Not only did he foretell the way he came, and how was he to come? He was going to come by a virgin. Hello? He was going to be conceived of the Holy Ghost, you see. And and someone says, well, it came from the seed uh, of Mary. Hang on here. The woman doesn't have a seed. The seed comes from the man. You see, and the seed that was in Mary was produced by the Holy Ghost, you see. And so we have this beautiful picture here. We see the place uh, where he would be born. See, this is all part of God's plan. And, re- and this is Micah writes about this. This is even before Isaiah. Micah puts, but thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. That speaks of his eternality, that God is eternal. 
You see, Jesus just didn't come on the scene in Bethlehem on December or whatever month, April or September, doesn't matter. He didn't come 2,000 years ago. He was from eternity past. There's never been a time he did not exist. There's never been a time he was not. He's always been, and he always will, you see. And so we see the eternality of, of, him, of him from old, from old to from everlasting. So God in his providential presence, that's what it means, God with us. Thou shalt call his name, church, Emmanuel, which is what? God with us. In other words, the providential presence of God with us has arrived. And the fact that God originated in history a long time ago. Matter of fact, when the Bible talks about Jesus being on the cross and dying for our sins, the Bible said he was slain in the heart of God, in the mind of God, before the foundation of the world. God kept his word. What was God's word? God gave us a word that, that Jesus was coming 700 years before. That's history. And God kept that word that night when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. God kept his word. Are, are you with me? Say amen. 1 Peter 1, verses 9 through 11. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace of God. What did the prophets do? They prophesied the grace of God. God kept his word. That what? That should come unto you. What did they prophesy? That the grace of God would come to you. The Bible said that he was, in John 1, 14, and the word became flesh, the logos became flesh, humanity dwelt among us, amen, God with us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, and for by grace are you saved. So the prophets prophesied this, and God performed it by keeping his word, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Do you realize that over 350 prophecies of the birth of Christ were in the Old Testament and now they're being fulfilled? All 350 of those were fulfilled that night in Bethlehem. Are you with me? See, God, God performed, he kept his word. And so we praise the Lord like that of his coming. So not only does God originate history, but God also orchestrates history. God orchestrates history. And look at with me in verse 2, if you would, please. Everybody in verse 2, say amen. amen. Let's see if God orchestrates history. And t this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. All right, so we see here uh, that God's in charge. Now, don't think that the, that, the, that, the, that the Caesar here, whoever here, the Cyrenius was the governor of this, that he was the, the, the kingpin behind all this, that his was his position. History is his story. History is God's story, Jesus' story. History is the unrolled scroll of prophecy. That was said by President James Garfield. Are you with me? Orchestrates history. So how did God orchestrate history of this arrival that took place that night in Bethlehem that was, what was prophesied over 700 years and actually over 1,200 years when we go back into the book of San Samuel, if you want to check it out. So you see, God knows what's going on. So you see, he, he orchestrates history here. He originates history. He orchestrates it. Well, how did God orchestrate it? He moves the nations. God moves the nations. Verse 1 told us that, that all the world should be taxed. What? That all the world should be taxed. See, God is in charge, folks. See, Caesar and, and the governor of Cyrenius here and all these folks, they were ruling, but God's in charge. So whether you like it or not, listen to me, if God is sovereign and God is on the throne, and he is, I want to tell you that the president of the United States is in the hand of Almighty God. And God will turn it wherever he wants or however he wants to. And he may be using it right now for a judgment against America. Because to say that he's not, then you're to say that then God is not sovereign. To say that he's not is to say that God's not in control. Because either he is or he isn't. 
Just because you and I don't understand it all and because we don't like it all, that doesn't change the fact that God is absolute sovereign. He's an absolute, total, complete control. He rules and runs and owns the universe. So God is moving the nations that all the world should be tacked. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Now, how many of you believe that's the word of God this morning? Yeah. How many of you believe that's true? See, you can't say that's the word of God and then say, but. See, you can't say that's God's word and say, well, then, but. Because then that's the denier to say that God's not in absolute control. Yeah. You see, so you, you can understand as God moves the nation because he's orchestrating history so that this night would take place in Bethlehem. So this arrival would take place. God is the orchestrator of this. He orchestrates. He moves the nations. Psalms 33, 9 through 11. By the way, is God moving you? Amen. You see, whatever God has a plan for you, and whatever God wants to do through you and with you, he's going to move you if he has to. Yeah. See, are you ready to be moved? You see. Huh? You talking to me? Come on now. If God's in charge of kings and rules them, he's in charge of us and rules us. See, so God moves things to accomplish his purpose and his will. Psalms 33, 9 and 11. For he spake and it was done. I like that. Say it with me. Let's read it together. Say it big and loud. For he spake and it was done. How many of you believe that? If God speaks, it's done. You don't question him. You don't argue about it. You don't debate it. Amen. I love it. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. I remember one day when there was a big battle going on and the sun was going down and, uh, and jo Joshua needed to, to take out a few more Philistines. So jo Joshua was a good Marine and, and he got to a hold of his commanding officer who happened to be the Lord Jesus Christ, God. And he said, I need a little more time. And the Bible says, and the sun stood still. Because you see, he spoke to the sun and the sun stood still. Tell me who else can do that. I tell you, nobody else can do that. Mohammed can't do it. Confucius can't do it. Buddha can't do it. Allah can't do it. There's only one person that can cause the sun to stop when he says stop, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty, who was in that stable that night when he put on flesh. He was still God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, I'm telling you, this is, this is fantastic. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart are to all generations. So how does God orchestrate history? He moves the nations. How does God, and guess how, what else he does? He mobilizes the family. Right? The word went out. Hey, Joseph, you got to move. Get your family. You're going to make a 90-mile trip. See, i got to get you from here down to here for being taxed. I'm going to move the nations. And I'm going to mobilize your family. God may mobilize your family. God may be wanting to mobilize your family. Whatever he has for you, whatever he wants for you to do. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know, say that with me, and we know. All right, what do we know, church? We know that what? How many things? All. What's the word, Greek word for all? All. all. Do you believe that? So that means when you're in a hospital, do you believe God's working things out for your good? Does that believe when your gut's wide open and, 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 and you've got uh, some colon removed, do you believe, still believe that God is working it for your good? Yes. Okay. Uh, and all that you're going through and infections and your arms all swollen, your veins have collapsed, is God still in control? Yes. God is still God, all right? And he's going to work it out for your good because that's what the word of God says. Yes. Doesn't matter whether you and I understand it or not. God's word is God's word. And it's better that we just trust. This is why I keep saying, trust him. God, I don't understand this. I don't know why I'm going through this. Uh, I, I don't like this. I mean, there's nothing wrong with telling God how you feel. He knows how you feel anyway. So you might as well be truthful and say so. I'm tired of this. This is getting aggravating. It's never going to end. I mean, there, there's your moaning and groaning. But when you get through with all your moaning and groaning, say, God, I'm going to trust you in all of this. We just don't get to that place. But we need to. Why? Because all things are going to work together for good. Can I get an amen? amen? Now notice, it's going to work together for good to them that love God. Now you say you love God, then all this that you're going through, you got to keep loving him. Because it's going to work together for your good. To them who are called according to his 
purpose. God is orchestrating something in your life and in my life. And it's going to work for my good because it's going to be for his purpose and for his glory. So we might as well just start getting used to it and trusting God and give God the glory already. Amen? Amen. While you're going through it, while you're experiencing it, just start giving God the glory. You have to jump on it. Amen? Why not? As God mobilizes us, God mobilizes a lot of us all the time. And so praise the Lord. So we looked at the providential presence of God, God with us. He originates history. He planned, he, the plan was foretold. The plan was uh, uh, performed. Then he orchestrates history. The nations were moved. The family was mobilized. So let's look at the second truth of the incarnation this morning. A personal presence. A personal presence. Look with me in verse 6, if you would, please. Verse number 6. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. I want you to see the personal presence here. Again, in Isaiah 7, 14, we already read it. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin, not a young woman, but a virgin, shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. I want you to know about this personal presence of the presence of God, God with us. It's a personal presence. Is he with you this morning? Well, if I'm somebody saved in here this morning, amen. Is God with you this morning? Yes. See, folks, if you're saved, God is with you. If you're born again, God is with you. If you have the Spirit of God living in you, God is with you. He said, I will abide in you, and you will abide in me, and I will abide and dwell in you forever. So the personal presence of God is in your life. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though you're going through all these things, you don't understand all these things. Trust Him. Lean not unto thine own understanding, but in all of thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death this morning in the hospital and what you're going through, I want to tell you something. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou will fear no evil, evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff shall comfort me. Thou, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemy. My, uh, thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Trust him. Amen. Trust him. His personal presence this morning, I want you to see the timing of his birth. The timing of his birth. The days were accomplished. Are you with me? The days were accomplished. Galatians 4.4 4, But when the fullness of time was come, that time's come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. It was God's time. So you see the personal presence of God arriving in Bethlehem that night was God's timing, not Mary and Joseph's. It was God's timing. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. Are you with me? That night. Oh, the timing of his birth. I want you to notice the travail of his birth. Look at verse 6 again with me. Look at the travail of his birth in verse 6. You there with me? Say amen. And so it was that while she was there that the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. That she should be delivered. Now we're talking about here the travail of his birth, that she should be delivered. The travail, let's see, this had to, and you know what travail is, that's hard, that's labor. It, it, it's, it's tough, man, I mean, it's tough. But I want you to tell you something, Mary's faith, there had to be the travail of her faith uh, was for the confirmation of God's word. See, God gave her confirmation of his word through the travail of her labor, of hard labor, you see. And it was her faith. So the travail, you may have to go through some tough times. There may be some, some travail in your life that you don't understand. And it hurts. And I know it hurts. And you don't know if it's going to end. And how much longer do I got to go through this? And you get to a place where you beg God to even take you home. I've talked with saints in the hospital. I've talked to them already this week. I want to go home. I'm ready to go home. I'm tired. I've had enough. I want to go. Well, hey, you're going to go when God says go. Trust me. If God says and he sees you've had enough, he'll call you home to glory. He'll not put more on you than you can bear. So if you're still here, then you can 
can bear it because God has a plan and a purpose and he's going to get you through this, but he wants you to trust him and give him the glory. Amen. There may be some travailing. Your family, your business, your home, and you're travailing. Oh, but then look at the truth of his verse, birth. This personal presence of God with us. The timing of his birth, the travail of his birth. I want you to see the truth of his birth. Look at verse 7 with me. Look at verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. What did she do? She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, grave clothes, laid him in a cattle trough because there was no room for them in the end. How sad, how sad. But the truth of his birth, Philippians 2, 5, Paul put it this way. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not equal, a robbery to be equal with God. See, even though Jesus was God, and he was equal with God, you see, but he made of himself of, a, a, of the likeness of men, and he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He humbled himself. He fashioned himself as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of of the cross. That's why she was wrapped in swaddling clothes, grave car clothes, placed in a cattle trough, which was a picture of the grave, uh, you see, because God had this all planned uh, for us, my friend, that he was born to die for you and me. You see, Jesus is the reason for the season, and you and I are the reason for the season, because you see, we were born sinners. And we needed a savior. So we had a need and God met the need. He sent Jesus to take care of our sin problem. Oh, praise the Lord, this personal presence of God in our lives, the very wonderful timing of his birth, the travail of his birth, the truth of his birth. Oh, praise the Lord. Christ was content with a stable when he was born so that you and I could have a mansion when we die. Aren't you glad you're going to have a mansion? And Jesus left the portals of glory. He left heaven, all the splendor of heaven, the new Jerusalem, the streets of gold, and walls of diamond, and jaspers, and the crystal clear river flowing from the throne of God. Just think, he, he stepped all out of all of that, CJ, one day. When God's timing and God's plan and God sent forth his son, what did he do? He humbled himself. He clothed himself in humanity. He stepped out of the portals of glory, came to live on this planet with us, walk around for 33 and a half years, and then go to the cross and die for us so we could go live in a mansion someday with him. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Wow. Praise the Lord. Charles Wesley wrote this poem, Rise, the Woman's Conquering Seed. Now, remember, I put the seed there in capital because it was God's seed. The seed doesn't come by the woman. Bruise in us the serpent's head. Now display the saving power. Ruined nature now restored. It's a poem that Charles Wesley wrote. You see, Satan, the seed of God, bruised the head of Satan. Boom. Oh, praise God. The personal preference of his incarnation. So we see the providential presence of his incarnation. God originated everything. God orchestrated everything. See, folks, that's why you and I can't say anything about it. That's why you can't go around bragging and tooting your horn that all this is because of what you did or how you did it or the way you did it or why you did it or how you performed it or how you bought it. No, my friend, it's all to Jesus, all to Jesus we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but Jesus' blood washed it white as snow. Why? Because there's power in the blood. There's cleansing power in the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, let's look at the last part. Let's look at the third aspect of the incarnation of this arrival, and that is the provisional preference, the provi presence, the provisional presence that God provided for us. And that is in verse 7 as well. The scripture says in verse 7 there, and she brought forth her son and wrapped him in swaddly clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. 
I want you to see that thirdly this morning, the pro provisional preference, uh, presence of God. In other words, he provided redemption through his death. God provided redemption for mankind, for all the world, through his death. Jesus died for all. He died for all of mankind. He died for all the sins of the world, all the sins of man that ever would be. And God made that provisional presence of that because he provided redemption through his death. Listen to what Paul said in the church, the letter to Colossae in Colossians 1, 14 and 15. In whom, that is in Jesus, we have what? Talk, what do we have? What do we have in Christ this morning, church? Okay, it's not in the church. Come on, somebody help me here this morning. Redemption is not in the church. Redemption is not in a denomination. Redemption is not in some guru. Redemption is not in some other prophet or some other preacher or some other Messiah. Redemption is only in the person of Jesus Christ. And God provided uh, that redemption through the death of Christ. That's the picture we see there in the manger. And that's why the Bible says he became obedient even to the death of the cross. So God provided redemption for all of us. Who is in the, and the Lord says, in whom we have redemption. How do we have redemption? Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. Oh, praise God. He's the invisible image. You've seen him. That's why Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. You see, and they could never get a hold of that. And most of the cults out there today don't get a hold of it either. See, that's the difference between us and a lot of them. We believe in the deity of Christ. We believe that Jesus is God. We believe that God is incarnate in the flesh in the person of Christ. Okay, and that's a, the key to our statement of our faith in which we stand on and the virgin birth and all that this goes on, that God made this provisional presence that through his redemption, thank God, 1 John 4, 9 says this, in this was manifested or made revealed, made known the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. What a provisional provision of his presence that he did it through the redemption, through his death. Not only does he provide redemption, but he provides a relationship with God. Jesus provides, or God provided, a relationship with him uh, through Jesus Christ. Salvation is provided through Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the only salvation you're going to get. You're not going to get salvation from the church. You're not going to get it through a father, through a priest, through a cardinal, through a bishop, through a pope, through a monk, through a Buddhist, through a Baptist preacher, through a missionary and evangelist. No, my friend, it's only going to come through Jesus Christ Amen. and him alone. God provided salvation that was provided through Christ. John 1, 14, I quoted that for you a while ago. And the word was made flesh. That's the word logos, okay? Uh, was made flesh and, and dwelt among us. What did he do? He dwelt among us. Why? Because God says, thou shalt call his name what, church? Emmanuel, which is what? Being interpreted, God with us. Are you with me? Okay, I hope so, good. Dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Why grace and truth? For by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. And Jesus told Thomas, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Thomas, nobody, no man is going to get to the Father except by me. We understand that. I hope so. And that's how we one has a relationship. Paul put it this way to young Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. For there is one God. Come on, somebody talk to me now. Can I get, some, so I get a witness in here this morning? I have to get my sign out. Can I get a witness? There is but one God. Everybody got that? There is but one God. There is not plural. No plurality there. One God. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. One mediator. Amen. Can I get a witness? One mediator. How many? One. Not multiples. 
That mediator is not a preacher. He's not a pastor. He's not a preach, preacher. He's not a Buddhist. He's not an evangelist. He's not a missionary. He's not a pope. He's not a, a cardinal. He's not a bishop. He's not a priest or a father. There is but one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Because, you see, God became man that day and became our mediator. And so that's when I ask for God to forgive me. I don't have to go through anybody. I go directly to the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sin because he is my mediator. I don't have to go down the street to the church. I don't have to get in a booth. I don't have to go see anybody. I don't have to beg anybody for anything else. I go directly to Jesus Christ because he is my mediator. Because why? There is only one. That's what the Bible says. One mediator, that is Christ, between God and men. So somebody says, well, who is that mediator? And then here's where everybody goes off and starts listing all those people I just mentioned. Well, let's see what the Word of God says. What's the Word of God say? Tell me. The man, Christ Jesus. God became incarnate in flesh, became the man, and became the mediator for you and I. Who, now, what did this mediator do for us? Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He was born to die. And he became my mediator and your mediator. That's why I don't have to go to the church. We go to church, but I don't have to go to the church for salvation. I don't have to go to church for, to be saved and born again. I don't have to go to church to get my sins forgiven. Okay? I don't have to go to man or anybody that holds a title or wears a collar or anything else. Amen? Amen. There's only one person who's going to forgive you of your sins. Now, you can get up here and say you're being harsh and hard. I'm, I'm not being hard. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm telling you what the Word of God says. Now, you can either believe the Word of God or you can believe everybody else. And if you believe everybody else, you're in trouble. Because if you're looking for organizations and all these different groups and all these different lodges and all these different court ordinance and all of this stuff to forgive you of your sins, you might as well forget it because there's only one person that can forgive you of your sins. You can join all the churches you want, all the denominations you want, but there's still only one person that forgives you of your sins. You can go to church a hundred times, you can get baptized by every group and everything else you want, but there's still only one person that forgives you of your sins, and his name is Jesus Christ. There is but one God, one Lord, and his name is Jesus. We need to understand that. You're saying you're being dogmatic. Well, this book is dogmatic. You're being awful narrow-minded. So is this book. When God says what, he means what. When God says, I am God, and there is none else. Does everybody understand that? You don't need a Greek scholar or a Hebrew scholar to tell you that it's plain black and white. When God said, I am God, and there is none else. Amen. Amen. One God, one Lord, one Savior, one Messiah, only one. There's only, there's only ever been one. There's never been a time there has never ever been another. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, we have this wonderful, and just think, you see, see, because God became flesh, because Emmanuel came to dwell amongst us, are you with me? We can have a relationship with him. Can you think about that this morning? You can have a relationship, not with religion, not with a denomination, not with churches, a relationship with God Almighty. And that's through the ministry of reconciliation. That's through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, I'm not talking about relation. I'm not talking about religion. Religion didn't come that night. Jesus came that night. See, religion wasn't born that night. God was born incarnate in the flesh, took on huma humanity, clothed himself in flesh, walked around us, dwelt with us, ate with us, talked with us, cried with us, healed with us, everything with us, and says, now it's time for me to go to the cross to die for the sins of the world and all of mankind. I'm going to be buried, and in three days I will raise this body up again. I'll walk around this planet for 40 days, showing myself over, over 15 different times to over 552 different people, and then I'm going to send back into glory, and then I'm coming again for you one day in the clouds of glory. And it could be today if you're saved. Simple as that. Wow. So, this provisional preference is redemption. It's a relationship through salvation. 
But I also want you to see, last when we're done, this salvation must be received. You have to receive it. I cannot receive it for you. It's something you have to do personally. Now, God's done it all. Are, are you getting this now today? On the arrival of the incarnation, God with us, God did it all. What did he do? He providentially provided his presence. He originated it. He planned it. He foretold it. He performed it. Okay? There, there, then, then he was the orchestrator of it. He orchestrated it. He moved the nations. He moved a family to make it all happen. Then there was this personal uh, a personal presence of him, his timing, his, his, his birth, travail. And then we see this prov a provisional preference that God provided redemption and a relationship with him, but it must be received. David, come on up here, please, sir. This is God's, represents God's gift. It's a gift. He provided it. He orchestrated it. He originated it. You and I had nothing to do with it. God did it. He worked it all out. Personal, everything. Provisional, provided it. Paid for it, bought and paid for it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he that believeth and hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Amen. And the wrath of God abideth on him. But God gave us a gift. Paul says in one of his passages, he says, Thank God for his unspeakable gift. This is God's gift. Now, we've talked about this for 45 minutes almost or more. And here it is. And God has provided it in everything. But he said, if you want it, you've got to receive it. David, I have a wonderful gift here I have bought for you. You didn't work for it. You didn't earn it. Come on closer here, brother. You don't hear about the pulpit with me. All right? You didn't work for it. You didn't buy it. You didn't earn it. You don't even work. You're not, you're not worthy of it. No. Okay. I just want to make sure if you're with me. All right. Okay. You didn't buy it, right? Correct. You didn't earn for it, right? No. Okay, and, you're, and you didn't earn it. You didn't do anything to get it. No. It's a free gift. Mm -hmm. I bought it for you. I paid for it. Okay. Okay, because I love you. Thank you. And I want you to have this gift. Okay. Now, boy, this is nice. You're going to like this. Matter of fact, I'd like to keep it myself because it's really nice what's in here. It's really good. I know you'll like it. And it's just, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. I mean, and you're going to fall in love with this. It's going to be everything you've ever wanted or dreamed of, David. And, and I want you to have it, David, and all of this stuff. But, David, you can't have it until you receive it. In order for you to have this gift, David, you have got to receive it. You have got to take it from me. Now take the gift. Now David has taken the gift. Did he earn it? No. Did he work for it? No. Did he pay for it? No. It was a free gift. God gave us a free gift. But you have to receive it, folks. I cannot do it for you. Thank you, David. You may be seated. Put the gift back under the tree, please. Amen. Now we need them. That one was awful light, though, so it must not much been in it. But thank you, David, for receiving that gift. And when you receive that gift, you receive God's gift of his salvation. You receive his gift of eternal life, everlasting life, because God planned this thing from the beginning. He orchestrated it. He originated it. He moved mountains. He moved nations. He moved people. He moved families. He did it all. And he even did another step further told heaven I'm leaving in charge to all the guys and the prophets up here and this is my version All right, I'm going to be gone for a while about 33 and a half years that will seem like a second for you all here in eternity in heaven but I'm in glory but I'm going to go and I'm going to step out of the portals of glory and I'm going down to be born of a virgin conceived of the Holy Ghost and I'm going to become man and I'm going to clothe myself in humanity and now I'm going to be born to die. Because the only way I can provide redemption and salvation is through a blood sacrifice. And I'm the only perfect sacrifice that can do it. Nobody else can. And I'm going to do it for the world because I love the world. 
And God gave us this beautiful, wonderful gift called salvation, eternal life, everlasting life. I love it when Paul said this thing, we must receive it, you know, personally now. See, I already got it, but see, I couldn't give it to David. David had to receive it for himself. See, the gift of eternal life and salvation was in that box, who was the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. As long as I had it, I'm in good shape. But David needed to receive it. He had to take it personally. That's why the Bible says in John 1, 10 and 12, he was in the world. How many believe God was in the world? Okay. And the world was made by him. How many believe that? That's what John 1, 1 says, all right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, the, and every, there was not anything made that was not made by Him. Okay, it goes on and on, all right? He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. He came unto His own. That's the Jewish people, all right? And His own received Him not. But I like the next verse. But, here's a good conjunction and in contrast in the Word of God. But as many... As received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And some of the saddest passage in the scripture we read, because there was no room in the end for them. Do you have room for Jesus today? Is there any room in your life for Christ? Can you make any room in your life for Christ? Today, about 90% of the world has no room for Jesus. Matter of fact, churches today, believers, quote, even today, don't have any room in their life for Jesus. And the world is dying and lost and going to hell in a, pa pa in a hand basket because nobody wants to make room for Jesus. The songwriter, have you any room for Jesus? Oh, let me encourage you today, those that are watching and listening still, my TV clock went off a couple minutes ago, but we'll see what we can do. I have a great editor. Have you had room, do you have any room for Jesus today in your heart, in your life? I hope so. I hope so. And I trust that you would make room for Jesus. Oh, let's make some room for Christ in our life this season as believers. Let's not forget a hymn and get all caught up into everything and not have any room for Jesus. A songwriter wrote it, well, have you any room for Jesus? All right, amen. Let's sing that song. David, you and Carol, come on and get ready for that. We're going to sing that song that's in your hymn, though. Have you any room for Jesus? Oh, friend, I trust you got room for Christ today. If not, make room. Make room. And let him come into your heart to life today and be your Lord and Savior. All right, will you do that? Let's make room for Jesus in our hearts today. Those that are watching and listening by television, radio, internet, YouTube, iPhones, iPads, uh, Rumble, Facebook, God bless you, our website. Praise the Lord, amen. Would you make room for Jesus today? Would you be willing to have a, a, it's a little room for Jesus today? He doesn't ask for much. He just wants a little room in your heart today and in your life you be willing to do that today? I beg you in Jesus' name. What we've shared with you today is the word of God, the truth of God's word. God did it all. And he wants to give you this wonderful gift of eternal life, everlasting life. If you're willing to make a little room in your heart and life for Jesus. Oh, please don't turn it off and go away. And say by whether words or thought or deeds, or thinking, whatever, I just don't have any room for Christ right now in my life. No, don't do that, please. I beg you in Jesus' name. Please make some room for Jesus today. Allow him to come into your heart and life to be your Lord and your Savior and give to you eternal life, everlasting life, and have a wonderful relationship with the Lord Jesus. Please make some room in your heart today. I beg you in Jesus' name. We're going to pray and give you that opportunity to do so right now. Those of you that are watching and listening and willing to do so, we're going to pray. That's communicating with God. Those are words with God. But we're going to believe. We're going to trust. We're going to have faith and believe that Jesus Christ is going to come into our heart and life because we're going to ask him. So let's do that right now. Here in the auditorium is wet. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Please be praying. 
somebody out there will get saved. Pray with me. Dear God, that's right. Go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord from heaven. I confess that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me, God, and to cleanse me. And he will, my friend, he will. I do now believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He took my place. He paid my sin debt. I believe he was buried, that he rose again the third day, just as the Bible says, according to the scriptures. And so right now, by faith, I would like to open up my heart and my life and make room for you, Jesus, to come in and to be my Lord and my Savior. And I pray this prayer, receiving you as my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And praise the Lord and praise God. Thank you for listening with us today, being with us. We're going to trust that many of you came to Christ today, wherever you're at around the world. Oh, I thank God that you made a little room in your heart for Jesus. God bless you till we meet again. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.